All right. Well, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Explorer Classroom event. My name is Joe Goreski from National Geographic, and I'll be your host for today. We always look forward to December on Explorer Classrooms because that's when we dedicate uh, the month to big cats. So we talk to National Geographic scientists, explorers, conservationists from all over the world who have dedicated their lives to not only researching, studying, collecting media of big cats, but also protecting them. So whether it's conservation, doing things to mitigate human uh, big cat uh, interactions, trying to end trophy hunting and things like that. We get to talk to some amazing people and projects, South America, Central America, North America, uh, Africa, Asia. Uh, so it's a lot of fun when we do these events. We always have a great group of classrooms joining us and today is no exception. We have classrooms joining us from across North America, both in Canada and the US. So if you're tuning in via YouTube today, don't forget you can still get in on the action. Use the chat sidebar. Uh, on the right, let us know where you're watching from, send us in some questions, and of course, to any classroom, take some pictures, post them on Twitter, hashtag Explore Classroom, tag at Nagio Education. We love to see pictures of classrooms in action. All right, I think it's time we meet Kate Vanelli. Kate is a conservation scientist whose career began in Namibia, working to conserve cheetahs with the Cheetah Conservation Fund. During her degree work, she conducted and published research on the community aspects of snow leopard conservation and ecotourism in the Himalayas uh, with the Snow Leopard Conservancy India Trust. Currently, Kate is the Director of Development for Global Conservation Corps, uh, combining her passion for conservation and people to communicate the conservation uh, messages, raise awareness and funds uh, for our disappearing wildlife. So Kate, it's so awesome to have you joining us live today. We've got a great group of classrooms hanging out with us. We're excited to get to know you a little better. Thanks, Joe, for that great introduction. I'm so excited to be here, and I see some of you on the screen, and I'm just really excited, especially to hi, to nerd out about big cats for a little bit, because when it comes down to it, I am just a crazy cat lady who is <laughs> trying to make sure that our planet can have big cats by the time you all are adults like me. So I actually wore my cheetah socks today just to show you guys how much of a crazy cat lady I am. I can show you. See the cheetahs? <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. So I'll go ahead and get started. Um, my National Geographic project actually doesn't have to do directly with cats. And so you may be wondering why I'm here talking about cats when my project actually has to do with people. And especially people like you. You're young people. But I am working with young people on the other side of the world in southern Africa. And so I'm going to tell you a few stories about some of my favorite cats and why they've led me in this direction and here I am now. So I'm gonna go ahead and start screen sharing. Ooh. Okay, there we go. And so just to show you how long I've loved cheetahs, I've always been kind of a cheetah crazy person. This is a first grade drawing that I did of a cheetah. So I've loved them ever since first grade. They've always been my favorite animal. And just to show, you might be laughing a little bit because this one used to only have two legs. Cheetahs have four legs. But if you practice and you work really hard, you can get pretty good at, at certain things. And so got pretty good at science to help protect big cats. I also got pretty good at drawing cheetahs. So this is my next attempt at drawing a cheetah. Turned out a little bit better. And these are some of the cheetahs that I worked with at the Cheetah Conservation Fund. So you may be wondering where in the world that is. This is one of the cheetahs. Uh, and I'll take you across the world now and talk about Namibia. And that's that little red country right there. Um, so we're pretty far away. Namibia is pretty far away. And it's in Southern Africa. And this has the majority of the population of wild cheetahs left in the world. And so I got my dream job working with cheetahs in Namibia. And I lived there for a lot of years working with these cheetahs. And I'm going to go ahead and let this cheetah take over the talk. I wonder if the sound will work. So that was Dexter, and he is one of the many cheetahs that came through the Cheetah Conservation Fund. 
And so what I was doing there was taking care of orphan cheetahs. And that was a dream job for me. That's what I wanted to do since I was in first grade. And I was super happy. And a lot of the cheetahs are orphans for different reasons. But the main reason that a lot of cheetahs were orphaned is because their mothers were killed in human wildlife conflict. And human wildlife conflict, a lot of the time means that wildlife and humans are sharing space and they're sharing resources or they're, they're working on the same land. They're working in close quarters and sometimes cheetahs because they eat meat also eat livestock. And this isn't just cheetahs. This is everywhere in the world. This happens. This happens in North America with wolves and mountain lions and even something like a bobcat. And this happens across the world in Africa. And so a lot of times cheetah mothers would be shot and the orphans would come to us and we have to make sure one, they have adequate care so they can grow up. And two, if they stay wild enough that they can go back out into the wild and continue to be wild cheetahs because that's where cheetahs belong. So this is one of the cheetahs I worked with. I just thought I'd show you her because she was one of my favorites. And before I get into these stories, I just want to go over some of my jobs at the Cheetah Conservation Fund. And so when I mentioned we release cheetahs back out into the wild, we like to keep track of them. Uh, this helps us gather information and data and it helps us know more about the wild populations of cheetahs. And so one way we gather information is camera traps, it's basically like a spy camera out in the wild. And it will take a picture if something walks in front of it. So I have a quick test on here. There's a big cat walking in front of this camera trap. Uh, who thinks it's a cheetah? Raise your hand. Who thinks it might be something else? That's right. That's actually a leopard. So cheetahs and leopards are sharing the same space because we got a picture of a cheetah on this same camera trap not too long after this leopard walked by. So that's one way, but if we really want to see where the cheetahs are going every single day and what they're doing, we can also use GPS collars. And so this will send a signal up to a satellite and actually send us information on a map to see where the cheetah is going, what it's doing, and then also if we want to check on the cheetah in person, make sure that they're doing okay out in the wild, we can go and track them on foot with a uh, satellite antenna or uh, radio antenna. So it'll send off, the caller will send off a little beep through a radio transmi transmitter and then we follow that beep, sort of like Marco Polo, but for cats. And this way, even when they're being really sneaky, like this cheetah here, we can check on them, make sure they're doing okay, uh, see if they've had cubs, and just make sure that the information we're correcting, collecting about these cheetahs is correct. And so seeing what they're eating, all that interesting stuff. And this ultimately helps us protect cheetahs. A lot of big cat conservationists will use this method to learn about the cats that they're trying to protect because that's really important. So I'm gonna introduce you to this cheetah. She was one of the ones that was orphaned when she was about a year old. Cheetahs will stay with their moms for almost two years. And so a year old is too young to be by herself, but she was old enough that she knew that she needed to be afraid of people. People, cheetah in the wild is going to do much better if they don't walk up to someone's front door and sit there like a dog. So cheetahs that are afraid of people tend to do really well out in the wild. And so we saw that she was afraid of people and we helped raise her so that she was big enough that she could go out in the wild, put a radio collar on her and tracked her. And so guess what she did? It's pretty cool. She had cubs out in the wild. And this is great because there's only about 7,000 cheetahs left in the wild in total. So the more cubs in the wild that we can get, the better. And she was an excellent mom. So she was part of an unfortunate situation where she was an orphan, but luckily we were able to get her back out into the wild and she did what cheetahs are supposed to do. And you can see there's two cubs there. It's actually a little hard to see. Um, and these two cubs went on to be completely wild cheetahs. They were raised by their mom. They did really well. Uh, and they grew up. And once she was grown up, that's one of the cubs right there, believe it or not, we were able to put a radio collar on her and track her movements as well. And this is really important because then we can see, you can take a guess what she did, what she did next. 
she had her own cubs. So that's her there as an adult. And those are her three cubs. And so this is really important because this is multi-generational cheetah reproduction. And so cheetahs are really endangered in the wild and they're struggling. And this is really important. This is what cheetahs are supposed to do in the wild is have cubs um, and basically be left alone by people. So this was great. So cheetahs in the wild are facing a lot of problems. Um, they don't do so well in protected areas like we have our national parks here. Cheetahs tend to live more on farmland. And the reason for this is that they are dealing with a lot of competition from other predators. So there's leopards in protected areas, there's lions, and they're all sharing the same food source. And so cheetahs often try to get kicked out. Um, so they're sharing land with people often a lot more closely than say a lion would. And this is a problem because people, a lot of people depend on livestock. So goats and sheep and cows, this is how they make their money. This is how they feed their family. And they're also using this land to farm. And so if you're a cheetah and you see this little guy, you might think he's a snack, especially if other sources of food aren't so available, which tends to happen the more and more people are on the land, the less and less wildlife is around. And so if you're a cheetah, then maybe livestock seems like a good option for a meal. And this makes people very unhappy with good reason because that's a lot of money and a lot of time. And oftentimes it puts them in a really difficult position. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about this cheetah and she had a little bit of a different story, but it started off the same as the other cheetah. And this cheetah's name was Zinzi. That's what we called her. So we tracked her for a long time out in the wild, but she was orphaned at about a year old as well. And she was a really tough cat. She didn't want anything to do with us, which is great because, again, like I said, cheetahs will do really well if they are good at avoiding people. And so we got her to about two years old, put a collar on her, released her, and then we tracked her. And something was really special about this cheetah. She was very independent, but she knew the people that had taken care of her when she was in captivity. And so she recognized us when we go out and track her on foot to check on her. She, she knew who we were, and that was, that was really cool. So when we released her, we went out, we were following her around with this collar, making sure that we were collecting all the data that we could, seeing what she was eating, seeing where she was going. Um, and she had cubs of her own as well, and she was a really good mom. So she had four cubs, um, and this was really special. She taught them how to hunt. She started moving them around her territory. She was showing them where she, where she lived, doing a big sweep across seven farms. So she had a huge territory. Um, and when these cubs were really little, she decided that she should, this is one of the most special moments of my whole career, but she decided that she should show her cubs us. And so this was a video I took on this day. What she did was she came out, we were tracking her, she stopped us what we were doing, so we crouched down behind a bush and we were watching her. And instead of running away or moving off, she lay down and she went to sleep. But right before she went to sleep, she turned around and she made this little chirping sound. And that's what cheetahs do when they're talking to their cubs and it sounds a lot like a bird. So she goes, ah, ah. And then the cubs came out of the bushes. And this is the first time they've ever seen people that they can remember. And so naturally you can see on their faces, they're a little bit confused. And they were about four months old here. So that's about how big a four month old cheetah is. And he was watching us very carefully, but this was an incredible moment to share with a wild animal. She's wild, she doesn't like people, but she wanted to show her cubs who had been following her and basically who was a safe person, which was really, really cool. And so that was a relationship that you build with a wild animal when you follow them for so long and when you help take care of them is something that's really special. And especially with cheetahs, like they're not pets at all, but cats are cats. And I'll show you at the end of this presentation, I have a video of a purring cheetah. They sound a lot like your house cat back at home, which is kind of crazy, but cheetahs are my favorite for a lot of reasons but that's one of them. So 
Zinzi was a really good mom, but unfortunately, when the cubs were about a year old, she was killed by a leopard. And this happens with wild cheetahs because they're sharing their space with other predators. The leopard was just doing what leopards do. But these cubs were only a year old, so they were in the exact same situation that their mom had been in when she was their age. And so we actually were able to capture them and take them back and make sure that they had enough space and time to get to a larger size and to become adults. And then we could put collars on them and release them as well. And so that's what happened. But a lot of times cheetahs aren't so lucky in this sense, especially when they're on farmland and they're sharing space with people. And through my experience working with these cheetahs, I saw over and over again that so many cheetahs don't survive well alongside people. And you think maybe, maybe it's the cheetah's fault, but it's not. Cheetahs are just being cats. They're being wild animals. And so then you have to talk to the people. And you say, well, what's wrong? Why, why would you shoot a cheetah like this? And they can say anywhere from, oh, they're pests. They're everywhere. They're, they're on my property from, well, I couldn't afford to lose that livestock. And I'm under a lot of pressure and stress. And if I can just get rid of the cheetah, then it makes my life easier. And so having these conversations led me to realize that really if we wanna be conserving cheetahs and other big cats, we need to be focusing on people and making sure that people and big cats can share this space because more and more people, especially in Africa, there's more and more people taking up the space and there's less and less room for wild animals. And so if we can make it so that people can benefit and appreciate sharing their space with these animals, then maybe they stand a chance in the long term. And so this was, this is when we captured them. So I forgot about that picture. Um, and then we brought them back. Uh, and so now they're out in the wild. Here's a video of a cheetah purring. <laughs> it sounds a lot like a growl, but it's actually a purr. So if you have a domestic cat at home, and they're happy, they make that same sound. So I'll escape out of there. But that's what led me to my project that I'm working on now. And I'm working especially with young people like you who are open to being really excited about wildlife and really excited about something like a cheetah. Uh, and surprisingly, a lot of people, especially outside of Kruger National Park, which is one of the biggest national parks in South Africa, a lot of kids your age, they don't even get to go into the national park. So they're living right there and they can actually hear lions over the fence but they don't get to go in and see these lions. And when they grow up, they grow up into adults that maybe don't care so much about the wildlife because they never had a chance to learn about it and they never had a chance to go in and actually see it even though it was right there. And so now what I'm doing with my National Geographic project is working to fix that problem and to get young people into the national park and seeing animals in person like the cheetah and then giving them the options and the resources to go into careers in wildlife when they graduate high school and hopefully help right on the ground in their own backyard. So that's what I'm working on. All right, very cool. Okay, thanks for that awesome presentation. Cheaters are such cool big cats. Uh, those are some great little videos. Uh, great to see some of the young, the purring. Uh, it looks like you had a lot of fun uh, during your time. I'm sure there were some tough moments, but. Uh, it looked like there were just as many good moments and exciting moments when you can, you know, help that next generation by getting them out into the, the wild and healthy. Yeah. All right. Very cool. Well, I think it's time we meet some of our classrooms. Just a shout out to the YouTube classrooms. Don't forget to use the chat sidebar and introduce yourselves. We already have a few groups who have done that. Uh, Mrs. Hills five sixes are hanging in in Keswick, Ontario. So here in Canada, and then we have someone else in here hanging out with us, twin A, twin B. Uh, and they're super excited about uh, your socks. They want socks like that. <laughs> so they're pretty excited about those on YouTube too. Uh, let's start meeting some of our live classrooms. So we are going to start off with Mrs. Aitchison's group. They're a new list guard uh, here in Canada, Ontario. Looks like a grade seven and eight class. Let's get that microphone turned on. How are we doing, seven eight? Hi. 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 These guys are. Grade uh, four, two, four to 
to grade eight because of the snow day today. Oh, wow. <laughs> All right, a snow day can bring together definitely a diverse group of classrooms. We're stoked to have you. Uh, and we're ready for a question if you have one. We're totally listening. Okay, what was the question we had, guys? Oh yeah, do the callers slow them down? Do the callers slow them down? Do the callers slow them down? That's actually a really good question. Um, so a lot of the older versions of the callers, when they first came out with this technology, they were really big and heavy because that was the only way that you could get all the information that you needed. But now they have great technology. The callers don't actually weigh very much. Uh, they weigh about the same as like an empty mug. I just saw a mug on my table, but that's a good comparison. And so the callers don't slow them down. We make sure when we put the collars on the cheetahs, that there's at least two fingers in between the cheetah's neck and the collar, so it's not too tight. And the greatest thing about these collars is that they actually have a little timer on them. So you can set it to last for a year, for two years, but when the battery on the collar starts to run low, the collar will actually fall off. And so the cheetah doesn't have to stay with the collar its whole life. And we can go collect it and we can use it again on another cheetah. It's really cool. All right, great technology and pretty cool that it's gotten lighter and even less, I guess, intrusive uh, for the cheetah. So that's always good too, when you don't slow down a fast animal. Very cool. Uh, let's see, Mrs. Fisher's group. They're hanging out with us in Carsonville. Looks like some third graders. Let's get that microphone turned on. How are we doing boys and girls? Hi. All right, I think I see someone nice front and center. We're ready for you. I was wondering if cheetahs could be albino. Albino, that's a good question. In my personal experience, I've never seen an albino cheetah, but there are types of cheetahs called king cheetahs, and they actually look a little bit like tigers. All their spots blend together into long lines down their body. And so I encourage you to Google after this talk, king cheetahs, because they're very cool looking and they're very rare. Uh, and many times they occur in South Africa. Um, but I've never heard or seen of an albino cheetah. All right, good question. I was curious, so I just did a quick uh, YouTube search and I'm skeptical. There's a few pictures here, but I feel like it's one of those kind of fake news things where they kind of alter the picture. So I'm thinking there's maybe not any albino cheetahs running around, but maybe you guys can dive in a little deeper and find out. Yeah, right. if you find out, let me know. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, where should we go next? Let's go to Green Acres, Florida. Uh, Mrs. George has some students hanging out with her. It looks like a nice big group. Let's get their microphone turned on. How are we doing, Florida? Uh-oh, oh, here comes someone. Hmm. Can you hear us, Florida? Give me a big wave if you guys can hear me. All right. Uh, for whatever reason, the microphone's not really picking up. Can you try and come really close and see if that helps us? All right, doesn't sound like the microphone's cooperating, Mrs. George. If you wanna use, down at the bottom of your screen's a little speech bubble, a chat window. Uh, if you wanna type your question there, I'll keep an eye out for it and we'll grab it as uh, our next question. So. I don't know why, but the, the microphone doesn't appear uh, to be cooperating. All right, let's jump to our next classroom. This time we're going to go to Guelph, Ontario. Mrs. Christensen has some students hanging out. Looks like some sixth graders. Get that microphone turned on. How are we doing, Guelph? Yeah, we are. Yes, <laughs> All right, who's up? Okay, Callum. Callum, come on up. Callum, you got to snow down. Hold on, Samson. Okay, Callum, stand. Dubu, Dubu. There we go. Now you get to ask your question. How many cheetahs are born in one year? How many cheetahs are born in one year? That really depends. So uh, we have about 7,000 cheetahs in the whole world right now. Uh, and when cheetahs are born, a cheetah mom will have maybe three up to maybe five cubs. And so they can have quite a few cubs depending on how well their habitat is supporting them. So if they have enough food and they have enough water, then they'll have more cubs. But unfortunately, cheetah cubs 
have it really hard. So, you know, lions, they have prides. Uh, other lions protect the cubs and they take turns. It's kind of like a babysitting type of situation. And leopards can climb trees really well and they have dens. And so they're able to hide their clubs. But cubs, when cheetahs have to go out and hunt, it's just a cheetah mom by herself. And so she has to hide the cubs, maybe in some tall grass. They don't climb trees very well. So she takes a big risk every time she goes out to find food. And a lot of times other animals will come along and kill or eat the cheetah cubs. And so she has a really hard time. Most cheetah cubs don't make it to adulthood. So about one out of 10 cheetah cubs will make it to two years old, which is not very many. And so a lot of cheetahs can be born in a year, but not very many of them will actually make it to adulthood, which is pretty sad. Yeah, I guess that's the trade-off of being so fast is you have to be thin and a little bit smaller. So leopards and lions and such um, are a lot bigger. So it definitely makes it tough growing up to be a cheetah. Yeah. Uh, so Mrs. George's group from Florida sent me a question via the chat and they are wondering about the cheetah spots. How do the spots help them? Do they help them in any way? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so cheetah spots, they look very similar to leopard spots and they have a very similar usage. So leopards and cheetahs are cats that, despite cheetahs, they're really fast, but they do need to sneak up on their prey uh, because cheetahs can run really fast, but they can only run for maybe 10 to 30 seconds. And then they're so tired that they can't run anymore. So they need to get pretty close when they're hunting and those spots actually help them camouflage. So a lot of times we've been looking for a cheetah in yellow grass and it's pretty tall. And even though they have black spots, that kind of adds to a shadowing look. So it looks like they're, they're in the shadows and they completely disappear when you see them in the tall grass and you can only see them if they move. And this is great for them because when they're hunting, they can get nice and close to their prey and then they use that burst of speed to go and catch their food. And then I imagine just like leopards, uh, cheetahs probably each one has a unique spot pattern. So you probably use that to help identify them as well in the field. Yeah, even on their faces, if you just look at a cheetah's face, they have their tear marks there, and that helps reflect the sun away from their face when they're looking for prey. But they each have a specific way that their face looks with their spots, and so no two cheetahs are exactly the same, which is pretty cool. All right, that's awesome. Let's see, let's take a little trip to California. We have some students hanging out with Mrs. De Monteverde. I'm gonna pop your microphone on. How are we doing, California? Oh, we're doing really well today. Thank you. We are a combination class. We have second and third graders in our class. And uh, Maddie has a question. Can you hear us okay? We got gotcha. you. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Why do cheetahs have orange eyes? That's a really good question. Uh, if you see a lot of pictures of all the big cats, many of them have, have those amber orange colored eyes. And I'm not sure why they have orange eyes in particular, but I do know that the difference between bigger cats and smaller cats is that the bigger cats have round pupils, if you've ever noticed that. So if you look really closely at a picture of a cheetah, the black part is the same as ours. It's nice and round. But if you go home and you look at your small cat, they actually have kind of a diamond-shaped pupil, and that's a big difference between big cats and small cats. Um, but I don't know why it's specifically orange. I think it probably has to do with how they reflect light when they're looking across a really wide space with lots of light. Cheetahs aren't nighttime hunters. They don't do very well hunting in the dark. Um, what we call crepuscular hunting is when they hunt in the morning and then in the evening when the light is low, but it's not too hot. So it's a perfect time for cheetahs to hunt. All right. We're gonna take another trip here. Let's go to Mrs. Let's see, there they are, Mrs. Howard's group. They're hanging out with us in uh, Ottawa. Looks like some fourth graders. How are we doing fourth graders? Good. Well, they're never this quiet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What are you guys thinking about there? Who's got a question? What's, an what's a cheetah's average lifespan? Average lifespan, that's a great question. So in captivity, so some of the cheetahs that we had at the center, they could never go back out into the wild. And the oldest cheetah we ever had there was 18 years old. But cheetahs in captivity, if they have a good life and it's low stress, 
they tend to live to be about 14 years old. That's the average age. Um, the average age for a wild cheetah that they found is about 10 years but oftentimes it's much shorter than that because a wild cheetah has a really stressful life. So they have to hunt all the time. They're putting themselves in dangerous situations. And so many times the average will actually be lower than that, but that's the published average is about 10 years. All right. So we're going to swing through our classroom, see if there's a couple follow-up questions, but before we do, I'm going to sneak in a YouTube question. So we have a viewer who's curious about, uh, again, thinking about their, their, their spot patterns. Uh, uh, if, if there could be a mutation where a cheetah would just be black. Have you ever heard of that before? You know, I haven't heard of that, but I'm sure it couldn't exist. I actually saw recently a leopard that was, was sandy colored. So they had a mutation where the spots of the leopard were almost rose colored. And it's really beautiful cat. Also something that is definitely worth Googling, but I don't see why that couldn't happen with the cheetah, but I have never seen an example where that has happened. All right. Very cool. So I think the way we'll do this uh, with the questions is I'm going to call out to the classrooms. And if you send someone up to the camera, that'll be my message that we need to visit uh, your room. But first, I want to go to our group in Florida. I'm going to spotlight your video. Give me a big wave. Uh, our group in Florida. There they are. Awesome. Front and center. I want to make sure you guys are featured. So don't forget, uh, if you guys want to send another question via the chat, send me uh, in that question. So let's see, where do we have someone up front for us? Looks like Guelph, Ontario. Let's go back to Mrs. Christensen's group for a follow-up question. Go ahead, Arlo. Um, so how do you take care of the cheetahs when they're like sort of not very used to like humans? That's a really good question. So we had two different groups of cheetahs. Like you said, there's the ones that were pretty used to people because they came in when they were really little. And then there were the cheetahs that came to us when they were a little bit older and they knew that they should avoid people. And so that it's kind of tricky to take care of a wild animal that doesn't really like people. So the first thing that we would do is we would keep the cheetahs far away from the center and the hustle and bustle and the cars and the people. And they would have a really huge pen or a huge camp that they could stay in that was had lots of trees and lots of shade. Um, and we would only go see them once a day when they would get their food. And so other than that, we'd leave them alone. They wouldn't get too used to people. When we would go see them, they're, I mean, they're smart cats. So they knew we were coming with food after about a week. They figured that out. And so what we would do is we would drive around the outside of the pen. And so that the cheetahs could get some exercise. They knew it was the food truck. So they would run along the outside of the pen right on the inside of the fence and that would give them their exercise for the day because in the wild, they would be getting exercise from hunting and we wanted to make sure that they would stay nice and fit for when they went back out into the wild. Then what we would do is we would move the food into a small closed off area and put it out like a cheetah would be eating in the wild. So on a little platform so that the food's not getting all dirty because in the wild, a cheetah would be eating on the inside of its meal and it wouldn't be eating dirt. So we put it out on a platform so that the meat would stay nice and clean. And then we'd leave that little enclosure and we'd open it up to the other cheetahs so that once we were out, they could come in, eat their food, and then go back out to their big open area. All right, awesome. Super important to make sure that they don't become too habituated to humans because humans are definitely a predator and a threat um, in a lot of ways, especially human conflict. And I imagine you had conflict with farmers too. I'm sure they weren't excited to have cheetahs on their land sometimes. Yeah, that was often, often the case. And so a lot of it is, is just managing expectations and, and making sure that you communicate really well with, with farmers, especially if you know the cheetahs on their land and you have that information from the GPS caller, you can let them know and just say, keep an eye out. Like, don't let your lambs go out into the bush, that kind of thing. And a lot of times if you're really open and you communicate, people really appreciate it. All right, uh, Mrs. Howard's group, Ottawa, I see someone nice and close. Um, what is the biggest um, cheetah you've ever seen? Oof, there was a cheetah named Hi-Fi, that was his name. He was a wild cheetah actually, but he hung around the center and he would come over every day because there was one pen that had some old cheetah ladies in it. We called them the Golden Girls. They lived there their whole lives because they were too used to people, but he would come and he would flirt with them through the fence 
and he would call and he would purr and he was huge. So 57 kilos for a cheetah to do that math, but there is 2.2 kilos in, or no, 2.2 pounds in a kilo. And so you can do the math there. It's well, over a hundred pounds. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a bit, that's really big for a cheetah because they can't weigh very much or they can't run very fast. All right. Very cool. Uh, Mrs. Asian group. I think I see someone there waiting. Let's get that microphone on. Okay. Uh, what is it? What is the fastest? Where's the fastest cheetah? The fastest they've ever clocked a cheetah running is about 70 miles an hour. Um, so most of the sports cars that you know, they can go from zero to 60 in a little over three seconds, but a cheetah can actually go from zero to 60 miles an hour under three seconds. So faster than most sports cars, which is crazy. Pretty wild. Uh, Mrs. Fisher's group, your microphone is on. Do cheetahs hunt in packs? That's a good question. Uh, so sometimes brothers, brother cheetahs, when they grow up, they will stick together in a group called a coalition. Um, and so they'll hunt together and they'll protect the territory together. But for female cheetahs, this is really rare. Most of the time when female cheetahs grow up, they go off on their own. And the only time that they're with other cheetahs is when they have cubs. All right, so we're gonna pop really quickly back into our class in California. I think their period is wrapping up, but I thought I'd see if they had one more question if they wanna sneak one in. Yes, we got one more question. Perfect. Do cheetahs only live in Af in Africa? That's also a really good question. And you might be surprised at the answer. There actually is a population of, they think less than maybe 40 cheetahs in Iran, in the Middle East. Um, and that's a subspecies called the Asiatic cheetah. Um, but they're almost gone. So less than 40 is not very many. And so it's really hard to get information about these cheetahs. Uh, so very little is known about them, but those are the only cheetahs in present day outside of Africa. But there actually used to be cheetahs in North America, believe it or not. So where we are now, a long, long, long time ago, there were cheetahs here. And if anyone, I'm in Colorado, so if anyone knows the antelope called the pronghorn, we see them a lot. They live on the plains. And they're the second fastest animal in the world on land. And the only reason that they're the second fastest is because they co-evolved with cheetahs in North America, which is really cool. All right, absolutely. So uh, our group in California, if you guys do have to duck out at the end of your period, feel free. It won't affect uh, the call at all. In fact, I'm going to sneak one more question in uh, from our group in Florida. And they're wondering, they've been doing some cheetah observations, maybe. It looks like they've been watching some videos and they're wondering, it looks like they sniff their food before they eat it. Do you know why they do that? It could be for a number of reasons, but what I think it might be is that cheetahs of the cats are very picky eaters. They don't like to eat anything that was killed before them. They don't like to scavenge. They really don't like it if dirt gets in their food. And so if cheetahs are sniffing their food before they're eating it, they're probably making sure that it's fresh and it's safe to eat and that it's not gross. All right, fair enough. I think I've seen that in the classroom before, students checking their lunches and sniffing them just to make sure that they're, they're nice and fresh. So I think that's something they share in common with the cheetahs. All right, well, a huge shout out to our classes on YouTube. Thanks for joining us and sending in some questions. Thank you to our classrooms from across North America. You guys are awesome. Thanks for the great questions, battling snow days and all kinds of fun stuff like that to hang out with us. And then Kate, huge thank you to you for spending a little time with us, uh, sharing your journey. Uh, starting with cheetahs to the great organization that you're you're working with now and spreading that knowledge that important knowledge to the next generation to kids who you know live so close to a national park but don't get that chance to actually see it so that's pretty important so thanks so much for the work you're doing and hanging out with us today cool thanks so much joe i had a ton of fun with you all and i really appreciated the questions and if you have a chance to talk about this after i would love to hear why your class thinks it's important to care about cheetahs and other big cats. So if you want to send me your answers to that question, I would be super happy.
All right. So classrooms, we'll make a deal. If you have want to answer that question to Kate about why you think it's important, absolutely send me those and I'll send them to Kate. But Kate, I want to know something that I was just thinking about before we sign off. Do you feel any faster when you wear your cheetah socks? Or do you oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I can run almost 60 miles an hour. All right. Very cool. So last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to unmute all the microphones, boys and girls. Let's get nice and loud. A big goodbye and thank you before we sign off for today. We're ready. Awesome job, boys and girls. Thanks so much for hanging out. We have lots more big cat action this week. Check out uh, nationalgeographic.org under education to find what we have coming up this week. And we hope we see some more of your classrooms uh, and some Explorer classrooms this week. So again, Kate, thanks so much. Everyone enjoy the rest of your day. We're signing off. Bye.